Uh, and uh, we're very pleased to have Mike Mancini from Baylor College of Medicine. And if I could remember the talk, name of his title, I, talk title, I would tell it to you, but um, you're going to see it in just a moment. He's going to talk to us about detecting estrogen uh, and, and, and uh, hormone interactions in single cells. <laughs> We've had projection problems, but oh, there we go. That'll be a lot easier. Uh, thanks to the organizers. It's indeed a pleasure to come here uh, and share what we've been doing in single cell imaging and really a basic science approach that got us going for many, many years and in the last decade or so really moving into uh, environmental uh, effectors of the biology. So this is something that can come out of any textbook, a transcription complex, nuclear receptors, uh, dimerize and bind a response element, recruiting all sorts of cofactors. Uh, our department, uh, Bert O'Malley's cell biology department at Baylor is one of the founding molecular endocrinology departments. And this has been done, oops, this has been just been fantastic for someone that does imaging because all these molecules have been pretty much worked out. Tremendous amounts of mass spec in the last 10 years. We know all the players, but how do you take the population-based studies uh, and apply them at a single cell level. All this information has been collected on large lump numbers of cells and tissue. Cell to cell or even allele by allele, and I'll wind up the talk uh, from allele-specific heterogeneity. Uh, the, are, they're impossible to detect when you just grab you know, millions of cells. So we have studied over the last decade or so ways to build and visualize model systems, especially with more and more complexity and more and more speed, to get to the point where, and this is really added on in recent years, could we do some endocrine disruptor testing? There's no shortage of uh, information out there on last year's hurricane that hit Houston. It was quite an experience. Uh, I can't imagine ever spending a week inside my house and watching the floodwaters come up and then recede. Never got into our house, at least. We were quite lucky, but there was 150,000 homes that were flooded. With what? Water. From where? Not the greatest source of water to put into your homes. Galveston Bay, Houston Ship Channel. This is what pretty much launched a new uh, super fund led by Yvonne Rusin up in College Station. Uh, and we have a project to look at uh, eventually getting, we're just diving into water samples now, of the type of materials that were in people's homes. And we needed to develop ways to get to that point. So going back quite a few years, and again, watch the monitors. I don't think you'll see too much on the, the projection here. You know, how do you get to single cell analysis? Oops, I didn't load the video. Oh, the video didn't play. It did. Oh, and I couldn't even see it. Go back. One more. Dang. Challenging. It's not playing. Well, I'll, we're short on time. Now you say there's a keyboard and a mouse here, <laughs> and you can't see the mouse. Well, in short, I mean, this is old data. The general idea was that you know, a long time ago, we could follow a, a single cell and look at hormone effects on the left, nuclear receptor, androgen receptor, goes from the cytoplasm to the nucleus quite quickly. It, depending on the cell, it could be a few minutes or it could be a, an hour or two. On the right, inside the nucleus of an estrogen receptor expressing cell, there's not trafficking in out of the nucleus that really, it's mostly resident in the nucleus, but inside the nucleus you can see hormone-induced changes in the nuclear structure. <laughs> there's the movie now. So what was missing from all that, and as transcription uh, study happened over many, many years, there's all sorts of information missing from those simple translocation studies. Where is the d receptor binding the DNA? Uh, what is the occupancy? These are all types of things that are done on millions of cells and increasingly fewer and fewer cells. 
But we wanted to try and come up with a way of examining as much of the molecular endocrinology one cell at a time as fast as possible. Why is that important? Uh, and I think throughout our seminars or talks today and uh, tomorrow, the idea of heterogeneity already ex expressed. If you look at tissues uh, with different steroid receptors, different types of cancer, androgen receptor, progesterone receptor, glucocorticoid, or estrogen receptor, you see in tumors some cells have a lot, some have none. Sometimes there's very few cells that are positive, sometimes there are many. But when we look at cell cultures that we use to study these types of tumors, the distribution of, or the homogeneity, it really isn't there. A few years ago, we were able to label three different receptors in a breast cancer cell line, MCF7. We thought they were pretty pure. If you can see, especially on the monitors, the degree of the three different colors, red, green, and blue, representing three receptors, you get a, a complete spectrum of some cells have one or two or three, or maybe some have none. That's heterogeneity. Even if you single cell clone these, they grow out looking the same way. So anytime someone's trying to look at a story from bulk cells, you have to consider that it's still a mishmash of heterogeneity. Hence the need for a single cell analysis which, just very basic stuff here, showing nuclear translocation of the different receptors, sort of a 3D scatter plot. So what we wanted to do was build a system that would give us more mechanism. We did that through a story that really started with the prolactin, uh, prolactin promoter many years ago. It was an early uh, tamoxifen target. It was well studied and uh, promoter bashing done for years. There's response elements. We took the response elements, we sort of amped up the five prime end of the promoter, tagged it to a reporter gene just to see it. We thought at the time that we'd use a fluorescent reporter. Turns out all the things we're interested in happened way faster than the proteins ever made. So we typically do mRNA fish to look at transcription. If you look at adding hormone in the cell line that we made, all the cells, uh, hopefully you can see, are GFP estrogen receptor positive. And if you add hormone, you can watch literally the receptors accumulate on the integrated multi-copy uh, reporter. If we now go further and look at one of those spots in one nucleus, this is the collection of Again, there's a heterogeneity there. We can start seeing the receptor binding in different ways, in different parts. Probably, we don't know for sure, if each of these little spots are an integrated plasmid that represent probably 100 molecules or so each of GFP. That's all in progress. We have multiple levels of super resolution now. This is around 100 nanometer uh, structured illumination. It opened the door, though, to study how can we quantify? This is a representation of what happens with different hormones. With the estrogen uh, agonist, you can see the size and the shape is bigger, it's fluffier, it has more texture than down below uh, with tamoxifen. If you look in another channel, this can be RNA polymer, this is RNA polymerase, it could be anything. We uh, go two, three, four colors sometimes, but watching the recruitment of polymerase with an agonist we call this a type of visual chromatin IP, essentially. We can watch molecules landing on the transcription locus. Down in tamoxifen, there's no recruitment to that locus. It's small and uh, very little structure. And then on the right here, what had to happen was developing the image analysis routines so that, long story short, and I know I'm holding up uh, lunch, so I'll go as fast as I can. Uh, this is now the mechanistic readout from our assays and it's all been shrunk down to 384 well plates. We invested heavily in the last 10 years through a lot of state of Texas uh, cancer uh, money, the, the CPRIT program. They've put uh, into both our screening program and uh, the more recent imaging program it's upwards of around $25 million in the last eight years for equipment and personnel. So the program's going great. Now we're moving into what do we do now that we have a system, what can we test? So endocrine disruptors, I think uh, most people here understand that uh, there's endocrine uh, story throughout development uh, in most animal species. And what we're trying to do is find ways to augment what's been done in the toxcast system over many years in different assays. 
in particular uh, with the EPA studies that were done in recent years, showing that you can mimic and, and sort of replace an animal study, an oviduct, uh, shoot up a, a, an animal and measure how big the oviduct is, the opposite of high throughput. Well, different in vitro assays, if you put enough together, here's 18, and in fact, our basic little spot assay was part of that uh, through a contract with uh, Odyssey Thera that did a lot of high content screening for Toxcast down to now even four, but what we really want to do is try and understand as best we can, we can pretty much hit all of this information now with single cell imaging assays and down at a high throughput level. So what did we want to test? In, uh, about 10 years ago, we started, uh, had a very fortuitous meeting uh, with Cheryl Walker. We got involved, we did a stimulus grant, and we wanted to start looking at BPA, the poster child for endocrine disruption. We applied uh, this program in the initial steps with BPA. Sure, we can use that in our assays, but what about the BPA analogs that are popping up? They've not really been tested. We got our hands on a whole bunch of analogs that are being used now in plastics. They do a wonderful job in the grocery stores. You can buy baby bottles that are BPA free, and isn't that great, except it's got one of these in it that they don't tell you what it is, and they weren't really studied. So we wanted to try and take our platform and see if we can learn something from the BPXs. Can we quantify things and find out what they're doing? This was a big uh, collection of, of assays. We used our prolactin model. We did a lot of protein interaction assays with uh, John Westwick at Odyssey Thera. We did growth assays, reporter assays. The big mashup shown below here using algorithms uh, that pretty much are t help tell the story one cell at a time. Here's the message that most of these BPXs, as we call them, they're still binding ER alpha or ER beta. In fact, we were surprised the ER beta, which is pretty much the break for growth, ER alpha is the gas pedal. So these molecules are either stepping on the gas or taking your foot off the brake, not a good thing. Saying BPA-free on a baby bottle is rather disingenuous at the least, I would say, uh, to the manufacturers. But it actually <laughs> led to us getting some work because there's manufacturers that want things that are not active. So we had a, a contract. We published a paper uh, last year or so, a, a couple of uh, novel uh, BPXs that, at least in our assays, and there were parallel animal studies, there was no activity. So it can be done except there's billions of pounds of the stuff that's already out there uh, and in our body, in our, you know, in our blood, and most of us in the Western world. So leading up to the Superfund, the idea was to take uh, a, a snapshot of what could be in the Houston Ship Channel and Galveston Bay and throw it at a whole bunch of different projects. We're down here in project four and using single cell analysis. There's mass spec, there, there's all sorts of things going on, even outreach for the Superfund. It's an exciting project to be part of. So we have, in the last year or so, been working with reference sets from uh, EPA and uh, elsewhere with each of these molecules, known compounds, putting it through our system one at a time and then starting in mixtures so that we can get to the point where we can take an unknown that could have who knows what's in it and start pulling out imaging-based signatures, again, in a very high throughput, sensitive, quantitative way. The sensitivity of these assays, our EC50 values are in the 10 to the 11, 10 to the minus 12 uh, range. They're very sensitive and they're fast. So showing snapshot data here, uh, just look at the bars. I know you can't read things. Depending upon the molecules is expected and maybe some unexpected uh, values showing how much DNA ac uh, binding activity. This is just a simple part of the assay. Did it recruit the receptor to the, uh, the locus? The same with uh, other compounds, uh, again, stretching it into uh, more endocrine disruptors. A lot of negatives, but we're finding positives. And we're just starting on the mixtures, showing that some mixtures do nothing, some are fantastic. And the image analysis and the computational modeling, which is fantastic and, and very, very dependent on groups of bioinformaticians that most small labs would never have. So as part of the Superfund, we have a whole couple of teams, uh, Wei Shui and others uh, up in College Station, helping us build models. And like I said, we're sort of at the beginning of this, but uh, excited to move it along. 
can't see it very good here, maybe on the monitors, I hope. An engineered system that I've been showing you, well, it's great and handy, but what about endogenous gene expression? If you look on the left here, here is a few minutes of hormone, a few cells, uh, estrogen, and then looking at an ER target gene, you can see some cells are positive. Uh, you can see green dots out in the, the cytoplasm. Those are the number of molecules that that cell made. How many uh, RNAs? Well, count them. We have wonderful algorithms that allow us to do that. But if you look inside the nuclei, you see a couple of spots. Oops. These are the actual alleles that, are, that show up beautifully, when you, especially when you use an intron probe. It doesn't get spliced out uh, or move away once it gets spliced. So you can see a couple of spots. So there's four alleles, it turns out, of the target gene GREB, a coactivator that's estrogen regulated. On the right, however, if you look at 24 hours, you can see most of the cell have three or four alleles. Lots and lots more message out in the cytoplasm. So it gave us the opportunity, well, what's regulating which cells, how many cells recruit, how many alleles recruit? This was sort of a jaw-dropping uh, finding that different alleles are responding at different times. We wanted to understand why. So we took it upon ourselves to get a small uh, epigenetic inhibitor library. Shown here, uh, what really got us excited was that when we looked at a two-hour exposure to hormone, plus where we should only see a few cells or a couple of alleles, we went through the whole library and we found with uh, methyltransferase inhibitors that the majority of the cells were now positive and the majority of the alleles were also expressing. So this recruitment from one or two or three or four, statistically speaking, alleles that are firing, there's a methyltransferase, an epigenetic story that, that we're just getting started on. So how can we turn this into something beyond what we're already doing? We've talked about you know, going from a record player years ago to a CD player, et cetera. Uh, we're fortunate to have worked with a group of folks that use a, a novel imaging approach. With a cheap 20x lens, we're now able to see single molecules of RNA with very large fields of view, one field, maybe five to 10,000 cells at the resolution that we need. It's hard to show this. Uh, you can see the different alleles in this particular uh, population here, and we can count them. How many cells have one or two or three or four at this time point, that time point, this hormone, that endocrine disruptor, et cetera. And it's turning out to be really a, a fantastic thing. Rather than spending uh, five, 10, or overnight just to scan a single 384 well plate, we can do this now in about 30 minutes. So what we're doing, really, I've said this for years now, we're doing fast basic science. Some people look at this, oh, well, you're doing screening, you're fishing in this discovery mode. Well, we're very methodically looking at things that make sense, and we can do it at the uh, resolution and the speed that uh, I've been explaining. Multiplexing things uh, are really where it's all going. As mentioned earlier, uh, all the different uh, vendors are out there selling different ways to do multiplexing. We've got new machines in, uh, including the one I just mentioned. It's all equipped with multiplex microfluidics so that we can continuously be adding probes, washing, uh, imaging them, washing them, repeating this going on and on. So we'll be going into, we're easily doing 10 to 15 now pro, uh, genes at a time manually. That's going to ramp up. Uh, there's been uh, a couple of pioneers out there that are doing essentially the whole genome now, one cell at a time, and we're getting there uh, at a high throughput rate ourselves. I want to emphasize the epigenetic part of it. Uh, there's a lot of interest in epigenetics, of course. This is something that, unfortunately, the budget uh, eliminated all the epigenetics and chromatin IP that Cheryl was going to do with us uh, on this project. Well, we're doing it single cell uh, instead. And as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, the question, you can't do any of this without good probes. And over and over and over, what is out there and available uh, buying from vendors is mostly junk. Uh, if there's 20, 30 percent of the antibodies for sale that actually are usable, I'd be surprised. What we've done is use these approaches, in the last uh, comment without showing you the data, we integrate all this kind of imaging as we're making antibodies. 
So we're screening all the primary hybridomas using the end assay. We want it to work uh, by mRNA fish. Well, we screen them under those conditions. We want it to work in a, a, a tissue chip or an IHC. We screen it for those purposes. The antibodies are identified without using ELISA. It's unnecessary. It's useful, useless and misleading often. So our antibodies are able to come out and directly go into these programs quite easily. The group at Baylor uh, certainly want to emphasize Fabio as a junior faculty. It's done incredible work in the last six, seven years. Maureen, a long-term uh, collaborator of mine for the last 40-some years, has been the, the lab manager and building cell lines and doing experiments that two or three people probably would be needed to do. The a and story, uh, and also the Gulf Coast Consortium is part of how we've built this uh, equipment and uh, resource. It's all been essential, and with that, hopefully we can get out to lunch and maybe get a little bit back on schedule. If there's questions, if we have time.